about a month ago, <laughs> first Sunday of October to be exact, many churches in this country were engaging in what has come to be known as Pulpit Freedom Sunday. Certain ministers around the country had decided that the restrictions against endorsing candidates and parties from the pulpit was a violation of their rights to free speech, and on that day they were going to organize and they were going to endorse candidates from the pulpit, and there was nothing anybody could do about it. Now on that particular Sunday, I was doing the question box sermon, and somebody asked me how I felt about this particular issue, and at the time, just off the top of my head, without knowing a whole lot about this Movement, I said, you know, well, rules are rules. We accept tax-exempt status, and so we have to make the sacrifice that goes along with that. We don't endorse parties or candidates, and it's kind of stupid to play games with that. And I left it at that. But my curiosity was piqued, and I had to know more about what was going on there. I had to have more of an answer than that. Rules are rules just as in the... A compelling response. And so I went to the Alliance Freedom Foundation website, which is the organization that promotes Pulpit Freedom Sunday, and I decided to read up on exactly what was going on in their heads. Now they insist that public freedom is a free speech issue. That because there is freedom of speech, and because in many traditions there is freedom of the pulpit, and I've got that freedom here myself, it's part of my agreement because there is freedom of speech and freedom of the pulpit, ministers and religious leaders should be allowed to say whatever they want to say from the pulpit, including speaking up for particular candidates and parties during an election season. That the reason they couldn't was because of a particular rule in the nonprofit code called the Johnson Amendment, as in Lyndon Johnson, who, when he was angling for the presidency, decided to pass a rule as part of the nonprofit code that said that nonprofit organizations could not engage in partisan politics. It passed. That's been the law of the land for over 50 years now. And the pulpit freedom folks insist that this is an unconstitutional rule and that they are going to engage in some civil disobedience. And I perked up at that a bit. Civil disobedience. Yeah, you turn universities are down with that. They were going to get in the pulpit on that Sunday, and they were going to endorse their candidates, and they were going to record their sermons, and then they were going to mail those recordings to the IRS. It was so beautifully passive-aggressive, that act of civil disobedience. It really piqued my interest. I mean, here I am, a minister in an admittedly anti-authoritarian tradition, and I was missing out on a chance to be But October 7th came and went, and there it was. I had missed my chance. Not to worry, said the pulpit freedom folks. Just do it another Sunday, that's all. Sign on up with the 1,600 other ministers who agreed to endorse candidates on that Sunday. Just do it another day. Participate. Get involved. Make your stand. So I figured, what the hell? Here it is. It is the last Sunday before Election Day. And I'm going to make my stand for freedom of speech this morning. I am going to tell you who I have decided to vote for. And because I am obviously an authority figure in all of your lives, I assume you will follow suit. <laughs> <laughs> so my subject matter this morning is who you should vote for. Sit tight. Get ready. This may be a bit of a shock, but here it comes. I think that you all should vote for Angie. And I'll take it from some of the nervous laughter around here that I should probably explain that a little bit. I was in Chicago this past week, where I lived for four years before I moved out here. And as I was heading for the airport to go home, and the shuttle was taking me down Lakeshore Drive, I couldn't help but think about all of the places and all of the people that I had encountered in that time that I lived there. 
Now our apartment down in Hyde Park in Chicago, its front door was between two restaurants and a convenience store, so it was Grand Central Station for a lot of the homeless population in the neighborhood. A great place to ask for handouts and sell the streetwise newspaper that so many of the homeless in Chicago sold as a means of trying to make money. And one of those folks who was outside my front door on a regular basis was a woman named Angie. She sold the streetwise paper. She came up with other means of trying to glean some income off of people passing by. She's one of the few people I got to know by name while I was there. I got to know me by name. We would greet each other this morning, in the morning, and we would talk to one another briefly. And she had a pretty rough life. The thing about homelessness and poverty is it turns into kind of a recursive loop. It's really hard to get out of the situation once you get into it. The deck gets stacked against you. The deck was certainly stacked against Angie. She couldn't find a steady job. She couldn't find a steady place to live. Her health was constantly in jeopardy because of living on the streets. And during this election season, I've heard a lot of talk about the middle class. Our candidates get up and they talk about, let's strengthen the middle class. Let's make it stronger. And as a member of the middle class, in the moment when I hear those speeches, I say, oh, yes, please strengthen me. Make me stronger. Get me a few extra bucks every month. <coughs> Until I think of someone like Angie. And I think, you know, I'm doing pretty well. I might struggle a bit at the end of the month waiting for the next paycheck. There may be some financial stretches happening there. But in the grand scheme of things, I've got a roof over my head every night, and I never miss a meal. And I can watch all the cable TV I want, I can burn my retinas out in front of the internet hour after hour after hour, and I can afford to send my kids on cool trips at school. I'm doing good. Strength in the middle class, I hear. And I think, no, you know what? To hell with me, I'm doing great. But I'm voting for Angie. And so should you. And for that matter, I'm voting for Seth. Seth is one of my old theater friends from back when I was growing up. We've known each other a long time. Around about the time he got out of college, Seth came out as a gay man. And Seth has been in a stable relationship with a partner for several years now. He's lucky to have someone in his life like that. But a few years ago, his partner fell ill. Fell ill to the extent that we weren't sure from day to day whether he was going to be alive the next day or not. And as you might be aware, for people in same-sex relationships, Visiting a partner in the hospital is not always a guarantee. Now, my friend Seth is lucky in that his family loves him and his partner, and his partner's family loves him and Seth, and so there wasn't a lot of brouhaha over Seth coming to be at the bedside of his partner every day while he tried to heal. But for all that time, my friend lived with the fear not only that his partner might die, but with a greater fear that someday somebody might not allow him to be with the person he loved in that moment. Someone might revoke permission. Seth is my friend that I love. pushed out to the margins of society to be seen as somehow less than human, less deserving of the love that he has. So I'm voting for Seth. 
and so should you. And Jane said, those are my endorsements this year. And yes, you're absolutely right. I'm dodging the issue and cheating on the question. But I have to. Because here's the thing. Maybe the pulpit freedom folks are right. Maybe. Maybe this is a freedom of speech issue. Maybe. And maybe, yes, the Johnson Amendment is unconstitutional. Sure. So maybe there will come a day when that rule will be lifted and any religious leader can get up in the pulpit and speak with impunity about anything they want to, including the endorsement of candidates and parties. But friends, just because we can does not mean we ought. And here is why religious leaders ought not. Politics, for the most part, is unworthy of religion. Politics, in the words of Otto von Bismarck, is the art of the possible. And what that means is politics is a messy process by which we figure out this diversity of us, this plurality of us, how we're going to manage to occupy the same space without hurting one another. How we're going to occupy the same space in some sort of sense of relative harmony. And in that art of the possible, we try to come up to the, with the best of our ability with reasonable solutions. For as many people as possible. And for the most part, that is a worthy goal. Reasonable solutions for how we live in harmony is great. Doing what is possible is essential. But religion, the activity of the church, is by no means a reasonable prospect. If politics is the art of the possible, religion is the art of the impossible. We are focused on something higher, something greater, something impossible. Ideals that possibly we cannot achieve in this lifetime, and yet we still try to walk closer to them every day. So for religious leaders in one instance to point off in that higher direction and say, that is the path to perfection and then in the next instance, point to a person and say, and that is the imperfect person who is going to take us all there, is missing the point. The eyes are off the prize. And those leaders have sold out the power of their faith for fleeting moments of false power. do it, they become charlatans who are no longer worthy of the attention of their people. And when they do it, they should just resign their pulpit. And I want you to remember that I said that because if I ever lose my mind and do the same thing they did, I want you to make sure I'm walking out the door. 